This is Problem Solved, the IISE podcast, where we talk to industrial and systems engineers about their work, ideas, and solutions. Welcome to another episode of Problem Solved, the ISE podcast. I'm ISE's Michael Hughes here with Dr. Mark Benden, director of the Texas A&M Ergonomics Center. And we're going to go over a bunch of office ergonomics and sit versus stand and the fabled 20-8-2 rule and see whether that actually has any scientific validity or not. Mark, welcome to Problem Solved. How are you doing, sir? Very well. Thank you. Glad to be here. And glad to have you aboard. So I first met you a couple of years ago at the Applied Ergonomics Conference in Atlanta. I believe that was 2018. And I remember at your session, you were talking about the 20-8-2 rule, which if I remember correctly, means that office workers should basically sit for 20 minutes, stand for eight minutes and walk around for two minutes. Did I remember that correctly? That is correct. And back then you said ergonomists really didn't have any scientific basis or data to back up whether that really is the way office workers should work to be ergonomically sound. But you recently completed some studies that dealt with that. So is it real or is it what they called it in today's media fake news? (laughs) Well, that's a great question. I think that we have some validity around the concept and the strongest part of the validity would be around the idea of movement. And so as we've gone further and further into the uh, sit-stand debate. I believe most of the ergonomists that are working in this area now have decided that our best recommendation we can give people is that throughout the day, they need to continuously change positions. So they need to move more, sit still or sit down or even stand still less. And so the idea, you know, being that movement is the more important of the three, if you think in terms of sit or stand or move, uh, movement is more of what we want to be doing. So I think that the 28 and 2 is a good guideline. It's a good mnemonic uh, for people to remember. It's something that they can kind of keep track of. I will say that we're finding that the idea around a specific pattern or routine or number is probably a, something that's going to have to be customized. In other words, there's one for you, Michael, and there's one for me, and they, they may not be the same. And that could have to do with our age or our, our health or our physical condition could have to do with other pre-existing uh, disease that we might have as individuals. So really the best solution, as with most things ergonomic, is more of a custom, right? So uh, just like we try to make tools or environments fit people, uh, kind of the foundation for ergonomics, it's the same thing with these routines throughout our day. You know, what's the best routine for somebody? Well, the best routine is their best routine. And unfortunately, we haven't quite gotten to that point yet where we've been able to have enough feedback from equipment or sensors either on the body or in the environment to detect exactly what that best routine is for each individual. But we're getting closer and we're working on that daily here at Texas A&M. So do you think it could be something where, you know, the fact that there are, what, seven, eight billion people walking the planet now, there might actually be millions of different routines and they should fit the worker? Because every person is different, so every situation is different, every office is different, every seat, whether it's an ergonomic seat or an old-fashioned one, is different. I think it's likely that we'll we'll not see uh, millions of iterations, but I think on a daily basis, you would have the opportunity to have custom input. So let me explain what I mean. If you take a person through a basic routine like the 28 and 2, our, our laboratory testing says that that's not causing any harm. It's not affecting cognition in a negative or a positive way. So in other words, it's fairly neutral. It's not not giving them any trouble. But what we believe is that if we were to interrupt somebody with a routine like 28 and 2, let's say, for instance, you are in a very heated discussion over an important work topic, maybe uh, with your boss, and suddenly the prompt, in this case, the you know, the hourglass, it's probably digital now, right? The digital hourglass goes off and says, hey, it's time for you to change from A to B or B to C. That might be very annoying. In fact, it might encourage people uh, at some level to sort of turn that off or tune it out, at least in the future. And so what we don't want is we don't want for people to miss cues Uh, that would be important at certain times throughout the day when they really need them. So let's say you are very stressed or you're very physically fatigued or just a really simple example, you've been sitting for too long. We want you to get that prompt and we want you to respond to that prompt and change your behavior. So that's kind of the ideal outcome. However, there could be circumstances of going on around you 
that would not make that the ideal moment for that to happen. Um, imagine you're having a, a serious conversation, like an annual review with an employee, and all of a sudden you stand up in the middle of it. It might seem a little intimidating or odd. Um, so we, we wouldn't want that to occur. Um, so we have to be careful. We, we need enough information from the environment about not just your physicality, but what's going on. What are you doing? What are you up to? Uh, what are you typing? What are you sending? What are you talking about? You know, what's the conversation level? What's your stress level? We need that information to be able to make good recommendations, good suggestions. These are gentle nudges, right? It's interesting how we're trying to get machines in our environment that we work in. In this case, we're talking about the office. We're trying to get these machines to achieve a state of, of awareness that really your best friend or your, your spouse already has. So, um, you know, my spouse is very perceptive if she walks in the room and I've had a hard day and I, I've got body language, you know, drooping shoulders, I'm looking down, I have a sad look on my face within seconds, she can pick up on that and she can alter what she says to me or does for me or does to me to help me. She can change that very quickly. Uh, machines have a hard time with that, right? They say, Hey, it's been 10 minutes do something different. And so we need to enable these pieces of equipment, these, these environmental uh, decision makers that they're going to provide some nudge for us. We need to enable them to be able to nudge us when we need it, not when we don't need it or when we would really be annoyed by it. That's very important as well. Interesting. You mentioned that put in my head the idea of artificial intelligence powering these sensors because it's almost like what you're saying, Dr. Benden, is you're trying to humanize these sensors so they can almost act as a human prompt like your spouse and get to know you over the years or over the months that you're, I guess, setting up your routine so they know when to prompt. You know, I as an editor, most of my life editing and writing, I'm hunched over a computer. Anytime, you know, 30 minutes, you can prompt me to change. It probably helps. Correct. But again, if I'm in the middle of that annual review you were talking about, you don't want my boss, you know, standing up and walking around and lording over me kind of during the middle of an annual review. Are you using artificial intelligence in those sensor environments yet? We're getting close. Uh, we're doing a little bit better job of feedback. So, for instance, the, the first generation that we had, um, we would prompt people strictly on that, that digital hourglass I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Then we were able to incorporate some sensors that could tell whether you were sitting or standing. So believe it or not, the early sensors would say, hey, stand up and you might be already standing. Well, that's kind of lame. <laughs> so, you know, then we, we got to the point where the, they could detect uh, what the desk was doing. So now they knew that the desk was in a sitting or a standing position. So that that's good. If you were present, it could detect you with either infrared or because you were touching the keyboard or mouse, you know, actively computing. We could say, oh, OK, they're they're there. They're present. And. They must be standing because the desk is, at, you know, 44 inches or 28 inches. They're sitting. Unless they've got really, really long arms and legs. They'd have to have something going on special. Yeah, it would be a, it'd be a very unique one to, to miss that. But uh, so then we, we were able to pick up on those cues and properly say, OK, they're, they're sitting or they're standing or they've been sitting or they've been standing. Now let's give them the nudge that they need. Let's give them a prompt that they need. Now, that would still possibly miss that high stress, low stress, uh, you know, situational awareness type of thing. But those are kind of the next levels. And then, of course, some of the biomarkers, you know, what's the, the galvanic skin response, say, as far as stress or heart rate variability, where we can we can pick up on someone's stress. We've got a number of different capabilities where we can have something in contact with the person. Mm -hmm. uh, we can have a wearable on the person. Uh, or we can have something environmental, such as a, uh, a thermal camera at the top of your computer screen. So your same camera you use to videotape or, or to do a video conference when you're sitting in front of it can have a thermal sensor as well. So you could pick up, for instance, the skin temperature on the upper lip. And when that temperature goes from a normal of red to a blue of cool, you're sweating on your upper lip. And when you sweat on your upper lip, you're nervous. We do this uh, next time you get up in front of a large crowd to speak. You'll pick up on that. You'll just kind of reach up and, and uh, touch your upper lip with your fingertip. and You'll notice that it's damp or moist. And that's just a very simple galvanic skin response that we have. It's, it's automatic. We can't control that. But it's a tell mm -hmm. that we're under a little bit of increased stress. And so we could pick up on that through the computer screen, for instance, and notice that you're having that stress. And we could alter our nudge or 
whatever it happens to be that we want you to do next, uh, you know, take a walk, take a stretch, stand up, sit down, whatever it happens to be. Um, so all of those things are beginning to come together. The, uh, again, the laboratory work on the 28 and 2, we didn't see cognitive declines. In fact, we saw slight cognitive improvements, um, but you know, it was only a, over a two hour time period. So the real uh, work that has to be done is, you know, what does it look like six months or a year later after you've been going through some of these types of prompts and nudges in the workplace? You know, are you complying? Are you using them? In other words, um, taking advantage of them. And then are they altering or changing or benefiting you? Then the real long-term study is that you you do these things over years and you figure out whether or not they're really impacting health. So there's a lot of acute measures of health. Uh, you could take something simple like blood pressure or heart rate, or you could take your blood sugar levels and we could see some changes um, fairly quickly um, depending on our habits and our behaviors. But if you really want to know over time, you know, do these things sort of alter our health trajectory? Unfortunately, we need years. Mm -hmm. So we've got to perfect what they are and how they work for the individual. And then we need to set those up to be there, be present, be in that person's life for years, and then come back and say, okay, definitively, this is or is not working to help health. That actually brings up two questions. First off, for the non-ergonomist out there, explain galvanic skin response, number one. Number two, next time I'm up in front of a crowd and I get nervous to, you know, fight off that galvanic skin response, should I take a piece of ice and rub it across my lip and would changing that physical symptom help with the emotional trauma of standing in front of a crowd talking? <laughs> no, it won't. Uh, it doesn't work that way, unfortunately. <laughs> but yeah, essentially, you know, we've used these, these types of responses on uh, wearable sensors, including during lie detection tests. So one of the sensors we put on people typically in either their, their fingertips or palms during lie detection is a galvanic skin response. So when you lie, you can't help it. You know, you get sweaty palms, you get sweaty fingertips, um, we perspire. And so we can pick up on that change. It's, it's extremely subtle. Um, sometimes we actually feel like we're, you know, our palms are sweaty or wet uh, to the touch, but much lower levels of what you would be able to detect is moisture can be detected by these sensors. And so it doesn't take very much change. Uh, you don't have uh, sweat like pooling and you know dripping off of your upper lip. It, it may feel like that if you're in a really big crowd and uh, you're not used to giving speeches, but uh, it's probably not really running off of your lip. It's just that that moisture content at the surface has, has changed enough for the sensors to detect it. And the sensors are good enough that they can pick up on that now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very, very subtle changes. So, so getting back a little bit of the 28-2, so the studies that you've done so far are limited to two hours and they show if I remember correctly, a slight positive for the worker. But to really make that valid is something you've got to, to do for years. Do you really have workers out there who will wear sensors for literally years? Probably not. And that's been kind of one of the limitations of the wearable sensors. And so, again, I think that what you're seeing now is a shift, particularly in the office, away from some of these active sensors that you have to uh, tape to the body or, you know, wear on your wrist, that sort of thing, to more of these passive environmental sensors. So I mentioned a, a microphone that's in your, in your environment, uh, uh, you know, the cameras, um, these types of sensors can pick up on motions and movements and postures and positions um, to the point where they can detect uh, facial expressions. I think we're up to nine or 10 now of common facial expressions that are validated for some of the facial recognition software. So the kind of the happy sad would be the extreme, but there's, there's a lot in between, but for lots of different people, these uh, softwares are able to pick up on these gradients of emotions. And that is again, something that humans are really good at, particularly for their friends and family, but they're, they're also pretty good in general. When we walk into a room, for instance, if you want to take an example from television, you know, I think the common scenario is that the police detective walks into the convenience store and there's an active robbery going on. And immediately as he looks around the room, he sees all of the people's faces and he picks up that all the people's faces in the, in the convenience store are stressed. Mm -hmm. They're all, there's something going on. 
And so the, the radar goes up that humans are so good at. And one of the reasons for that is that humans don't normally all display the same emotional facial expression at the same time. So when they do, that's a clue. That's kind of a trigger. That's a trigger for us. That's a clue for us to say, hey, there's something going on here, right? Our, our sixth sense kind of kicks in and that's our ability to perceive what's happening just from the visual recognition of those facial expressions. And so again, we're getting better to the point now with machine learning the computers are able to pick up on these things. So something as simple as recognizing you, that it's you when you walk in the room, from your gait, from your height, from the sound of your voice, from the image of your face, you know, the facial recognition, all of those things are important clues that now the machines that we're going to interact with, I think you mentioned in your case, the computer a lot for editing, it knows it's you. And if you're in a situation in an office where you have desks that are shared, you know, kind of common space, you walk into an office and you pick a different desk every day. You take what's available. And so it's very powerful for those pieces of equipment to not just uh, kind of turn on or allow you to log in, but to know that it's you. So to set things up at heights and depths and widths that mm -hmm. are for you, they're your custom settings. And then when you need it to prompt you uh, to change or alter. Now, keep in mind, we're talking about health, but I think from an industrial engineering standpoint, we also need to recognize the ability of all of these things working in concert is for human productivity as well. We will be optimized from a human productivity, from a human output standpoint, when we're doing the things that work best for our health. So the things that would allow us to be healthiest throughout our career are also going to allow us to have the greatest output. When we're uncomfortable and miserable, that doesn't work. How, how does comfort play into productivity? Because I remember growing up, you know, kind of old school, I always talked about pushing your employees, pushing your players. If you were a coach, you know, weight training, you'd push through the burn and through the pain and all that kind of stuff, which is it's just a very uncomfortable type of environment. How much does a boss, you know, dealing with ergonomics and dealing with stuff basically in the workplace where you're sitting, how do you have that kind of balance between pushing productivity versus making your employees too uncomfortable to work? Great question. I think a really simple uh, analogy with, you know, you mentioned weight training is, you know, kind of break it down to build it back up stronger. What we find with a lot of these cumulative type jobs, particularly sedentary office jobs, is that, you know, breaking it down at some level after some amount of time there isn't the recovery, there's injury, there's illness. You're just broke down. Yeah, you're just broken down. You know, you're, you're past the point where it's kind of good for you and, it, and you're just going to come back stronger. You're, you're actually wearing that person down to a point where they're going to have some malady that comes as a result of it. So we have to be careful, you know, with the construct around it. Anyway, about comfort, I think that the, the worker themselves are probably, you know, we, we, we have the opportunity to really help them because one of the, the challenges with these sedentary jobs is that we don't pick up on a lot of the cues that our body is starting to struggle and suffer until we're way deep into it. So, you know, after probably about 30 minutes, most of us start to have some changes mm -hmm. in our biochemistry, our blood sugar, our lipoprotein lipase is altered to the point where, you know, the productivity goes way down and that's a, that's a cleaner for fat in our bloodstream. So we want to produce that. Okay. And so there's things that happen very quickly after being sedentary for just a half an hour, but we're able to sit for hours and hours and hours. And it's interesting how fatigued we become just from being sedentary. So think about yourself getting off of an airplane after a you know four hour uh, cross country flight or something. You, you feel tired, right? You know, people say, you know, how are you? you say, oh, I'm tired. Well, what did you do? I sat on an airplane. I sat still on an airplane. It's like how people you, laugh at you. It's not really logical, right? It doesn't make sense. Like, how can you be tired from that? Yeah, but it is very tiring. And you know, our bodies do better in motion. They heal themselves through movement and activity. And so when we sit for long periods of time, kind of lack those feedback clues and cues that we need to improve our, our health. So comfort is a very big piece of that. We, we've done some studies now on productivity analysis where we measure output on the computer. So words typed, mouse movements, you know, how far your mouse travels, how many right clicks, left clicks, how many scrolls, how many pixels on the screen, the cursor travels, um, how many backspaces and errors. So lots of very objective data points. And one of the most interesting ones we did was with uh, about 13,000 workers. And we looked at it over a year and we looked at hundreds of these uh, markers or measurements along with their, their breaks. You know, how many breaks do they take? 
Uh, how many times do they have pauses? Um, the software that we were using to monitor is also capable of providing a break. So this, this particular software is made by Inviance and it will prompt the person to, uh, to take a pause, take a break. And it's interesting that the people who were the most break compliant had the highest outputs of work the way we measured it in the study. Now, you know, you could say, well, what about when they were in a meeting? Were they productive or did they get worked out? Well, of course, uh, we didn't measure that. We only measured their work at the computer, which for most people, most typical office workers is around four hours. Now, for someone like you, it may be more like six or eight. But for typical office workers with varied job titles, about four hours uh, is typically what you get. And so when you see that level of activity go up, as a result of taking those intermittent breaks, those pauses, I think it tells the story of how productive we become when we go back to doing what we were doing after our bodies had a chance to recover physically. I think it affects our output and our performance. So kind of the takeaway is the old sage advice that a well-rested and healthy worker will outperform an overstressed, overworked, broken down worker almost any time, including in an office environment when you're just, quote unquote, sitting and not doing any, quote unquote, real work. Yeah, we definitely saw that. And, you know, there was a self-report for those 13,000 workers on stress level. And I believe it was, it was kind of a one to five type of stress level, you know, one being very minimal, almost none, five, just, you know, stressed out of your mind, right? You know, you're just going crazy. Right. And uh, it was interesting because the, the, the people, again, who were taking the regular breaks, um, you've heard more of this recently in, in conversations about uh, mindfulness and just kind of being mindful of your body and how you're doing and how your stress levels are. And uh, that feedback to take that break and to, I guess, be compliant with the break suggestions that the computer is providing, those folks had lower levels of stress than the people who ignored or turned off or weren't very compliant with their with their breaks. And so there's definitely something built into us that, you know, we, we tend to kind of get focused, you know, we get that tunnel vision and we're just kind of grinding through our work and at the moment when we're the ones doing it, it just seems like that's the smartest thing, right? That's the best way to push through. But in fact, that's not what our data is showing. Our data is showing that it's better to give them a break, to give them a pause, to give them even just a few moments away from the task, you know, to, to stand up, look around, look outside, you know, take a walk, you know, go down the hall and get a drink of water from the fountain. Those things that break that up, they, they seem like, okay, you stopped making your widgets, you know, to, to use an industrial engineering example. They're not at their machine. They're not building their widgets. Or they're not editing their paper. They're not writing their story. And That's right. But with so much of this mental work being dependent kind of on our state of mind, not just our state of body, we can restore both by taking those little pauses, those little breaks. And we do that and we come back to our work. We're that much more productive during that next phase. And I believe one day we'll be able to measure things like originality, creativity, collaboration. And I believe that when we are able to measure those well, there there are some scales for that right now, Mm -hmm. but I think that we, we can improve on that. But I think once we're able to measure those better, we will also see that those types of things go up when people are physically and emotionally rested at their peak and that they're able to give their best to their coworkers, to their, to their work product or work task, whatever it happens to be. You know, that's interesting. You talk about the mindfulness of the employee. The first 15 years of my career, I worked in newspapers, and most of that time was hunched over a desk writing. Sometimes, of course, you go out in the field to do reporting, but as you know, I got later in my career and sat at a desk doing more editing, I could almost feel my soul sapping away. Sure. Started here at ISE and was introduced to ergonomics. Actually did a standing versus sitting sit desk story in 2014 that really introduced me to the to the topic. And I feel better now than I did 15 years ago, just paying a little bit of attention to getting up and walking around. Yeah, that's great. So did you notice any patterns uh, as editor when you were getting closer to the deadline as far as mistakes or errors? I did notice that the more that I sat there without taking breaks, the more errors that I would make. Uh, The most errors that I made in one day was a day that I wrote five stories. Mm. And that's a lot to turn out in a day. That really is. And I made three factual errors, which, you know, the previous year I'd made 
one. And right. that volume of material, you're going to make an error yeah. somewhere along the way. A small newspaper publishes basically a novel each day. It's almost impossible to do that without a mistake. But the more workload, the more you sit there and the more you just kind of churn things out without getting up and going and smelling the flowers, going to the bathroom, getting a drink of water, just walking. After I got here and did that story every half hour, I just get up and walk around the office. Sure. It really makes a difference. Yeah, I think it's really uh, something that we, we take for granted in the modern office because we've gotten so used to kind of being on the clock and being, you know, in, in the zone and just kind of grinding through that work that sort of missed some of these cues that our body's trying to give us. I'll still be editing something or working on something and just kind of get in that zone. But after an hour, hour and a half, I start to feel, I guess the best word is ooky and something will remind me that, dude, you need to get up and stand up and walk around. Yeah, it's important. Now, what about the equipment surrounding the worker? You know, you go to the Applied Ergonomics Conference every year. There are software. We talk about the NVENTS stuff the, the, with the prompts. There are all sorts of standing and adjustable desks. There are all sorts of ergonomic chairs. How does equipment play into a worker's comfort in the office? Well, it's absolutely critical. If we do a really great job, and I mean a great job, and there are so many great tools out there now to provide uh, the great equipment for the workers. We're about halfway there. Um, I think mm-hmm. the other half is made up of things like training. And then, of course, these these uh, living systems that would be present uh, with the worker, prompting, nudging, uh, you know, counting, calibrating, keeping up with, trending. Those are all really important. So, you know, like I say, you get the great equipment, the great uh, height adjustable, you know, electric desks and the 10 uh, adjustment ergonomic chairs and so forth. Mm hmm. You put all that in there and what some companies do is they sort of just toss it over the wall like, well, we bought our ergonomic stuff. I guess we're great. We're good. Or you check out. Uh, unfortunately, like I say, you're about halfway there. And so way, way better than not, you know, way, way better than not doing anything at all. But you really need to follow through with that training and that orientation and then those systems. And those systems could be computerized. They could be people. You know, you could have personnel that kind of go around and and, uh, you know, coaches that, that help. You can have folks that are part of an ergo team that are assigned to the office that take the time to go in and help and uh, work with some of the employees on a, on a regular basis. But there's definitely, it's not, it's not a one day, you know, we installed it uh, when we opened the doors type of thing that, that, that just won't get it done. So equipment's really kind of half of the equation. The other half of the equation would be having trained ergonomists to train your people in the proper ways of using these tools. Yes, I think you've got to have both. And another thing that was introduced to me when I came aboard ISE was just the fact of having standing versus sitting desks. Is standing really any better if you do it over the long haul? Don't you really need to adjust? We've talked a lot about of adjustability during this interview. And I think that's probably one place that you look back over your career and you think, well, wow, what are some things that I could have influenced or done differently or done better? And I think one of those would just be the the phraseology around those desks. So what I mean by that is that we really should refer to those as adjustable height desks, not as sit or stand or sit stand desks. The reason for that is the real benefit of those desks is that they can be customized to an individual, whether they are sitting or standing. We've now found, and this has been been really helpful the last probably four or five years, that in addition to kind of the classic seated posture, there's multiple standing postures. Mm -hmm. So we've known about a recline and a semi-recline and an upright type of seated posture for years. Those are in our standards, even like the ANSI HFES 100 standard. But we've now figured out that, you know, when we tell people to stand, what we don't want is that static standing still on two feet. We want them to have the ability, for instance, to put one foot up on a foot rail, just like you would have at a bar. That bar rail is very, very important. In fact, I tell people all the time, if you don't have a, a foot rail, something to put your foot up on about I don't know, six to 10 inches off the floor, you really don't have a standing station. So you have a desk that will go to a standing height, but you don't have a standing station. It's not a standing workstation until you have that rail down there so that you can shift your weight from one foot to the other and alternate posture. So what you do is you, as soon as you put that down there, you've given the person not just one standing posture where they can stand flat footed on their two feet, but you've given them two additional postures, one with their right foot up, one with their left foot up. So now they have three working postures standing, just like they have three or four 
working postures while seated because of the adjustments on the ergonomic chair. So it's really important that that piece uh, be incorporated. And then I would say the other part of it is that we now have additional types of uh, stools. We've got props and perches and leans that you can be upright on your feet or on one foot and not necessarily uh, sitting all the way down. And so that landscape has changed dramatically. So now you're seeing six to eight pretty decent postures that you can be in during the course of your time that you spend standing out of your chair. And so that is a tremendous amount of, of leverage or benefit compared to raising your desk up and standing for a few minutes until your back and feet and knees start to get sore and tired and then plopping back down in your chair for hours. So, you know, if we can pro- provide those alternative standing positions rather than just the one, we're more likely to take advantage of those uh, varied postures throughout the day. And if you got six to eight choices, you change that every 20, 25 minutes. And pretty soon you're through an eight hour work shift and you haven't sat in the same position for or stood in the same position for even an hour. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And I think that's the beauty of it. Yeah. Yeah. And a few years ago, I got um, not going to mention the company because it didn't work out as well as I thought it would. One of those perching chairs. And I really liked how it opened up basically my chest when I was perching. Sure. Unfortunately, I'm a very thin person person and it's basically a bicycle seat and after a period of time let's just say um the part of my body that i sit on felt like a rock and it really hurt what kinds of ergonomic chairs out there work does perching really work or i think the key here again is that you know we require variety we require change and so whether that's change of equipment or change of position it's absolutely essential that we're we're varying it. So, you know, if you think about, the, you mentioned the bicycle seat, so just go there for a second. But if you think about the people who really suffer, particular males, uh, with being on a bicycle seat for too long, it's the people who are serious bicyclists, right? It's not the, it's not the guy who goes out on the weekend and rides his bike for, you know, an hour in the park with his kids. Yeah. But the guy who's on the bike for six, eight hours a day training, uh, yeah, they're going to have some problems. Um, you know, it, it's really affects blood flow. And so, you know, if you're putting that much weight on that small of a soft tissue area, it's going to cause problems. And so, you know, we, we see this with different types of equipment. If you sit still in one posture at a, at an awkward desk height, that maybe isn't designed for you. It's too tall or too small. They're going to develop problems. How we help people is by giving them variety and then teaching them to listen to their body. Listen to their body, you know, when your body's telling you it's time to change, change, but you have to provide the environment, the equipment that will allow them to change and mix it up. So, you know, if we do something for 20, 30 minutes a day, probably not that big of a deal. But if we do it for six or eight hours a day, it's going to take a toll. And one of the studies that you're working on really kind of surprised me when I, when I looked at it. It's something I never thought about would be the ADHD impacts of working at a standing desk. And we're kind of switching gears here. I would have never thought that that would have any impact at all. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, what we have found is that the folks who, who struggle with ADHD, whether they're, they're young children or folks our age, they have a very different mind to body connection. And so what I mean by that is that for, for someone who doesn't suffer from ADHD, their, their mind to body connection may be very subtle. And that means that they can engage in difficult cognitive work in just about any position or posture or uh, sitting still or you know, moving. It, it really doesn't matter that much. But for people who are ADHD, they need to, to wiggle, to fidget, to tap, believe it or not, to kind of dance around and, and shake their booty. And, uh, you know, we don't fully understand why some people have this kind of hardwire connection to the, the physical body, the movement and the brain, the cognition turning on. But we are seeing with uh, brain scans imaging that we're doing now with with uh, folks who have ADHD and, of course, folks who don't, that getting them up and getting them moving really makes a difference for them. Now, it doesn't harm or hurt or really alter in any big way, uh, the folks who don't have ADHD. 
So that's good because, you know, when you when you look at these types of things in the workplace, particularly from a health standpoint, you kind of want to walk into it with the you know first and foremost, do no harm. So we don't want to cause harm to the folks who don't have this. But if we can allow for the folks that, that do have it to have the opportunity to dial in, to tune in, it really makes a difference. And I've, I've had so many stories from school teachers who said, once we were able to allow this child to stand to do their work, I quit sending them to the principal's office. They were able to behave. They were able to stay focused. They quit bothering their students beside them. You know, they, they really could do the task work like they were seeing the other children who weren't diagnosed with ADHD do. And I think that's a really important uh, differentiator for us because we, as a society, we tend to sort of go towards things like uh, pharmaceuticals, right? Everybody, you know, whatever ails you, we want a pill for it. I mean, I think we're all, yeah, we're all guilty of that. That's right. So, you know, if this is an opportunity to help some of those children to either reduce uh, their medications or in some cases uh, with Oh, some of the children potentially even eliminate other medications. That's an important area that we need to explore more. So we're, we're running a couple more studies right now. We've got a couple of grant proposals in and we're hoping to do more work in that area because I think it is a, an important area for both children and adults. You know, that's interesting. I have a cousin who, who suffered from ADHD and he you know, did the Ritalin thing and did a whole bunch of other options to you know, get him through school and get his university education. Probably one of the most brilliant human beings I've ever met in my life, but he had trouble in school because of that. I remember talking to him about it and he said, you know, Mike, 12 year old boys and girls were not made to just sit for six hours in a desk. The entire schooling complex is not geared to the needs of children. And it seems like the research that you're doing is is showing that he knew what he was talking about 25 years ago. Yeah, absolutely. I think that the idea of, you know, sit down, sit still, be quiet, it's very dated. We would prefer to design classrooms for, you know, more of an activity permissive learning environment where it's okay to move around and move about to change positions again to have multiple types of equipment in that learning environment where you know you can go kick back in a beanbag chair you can stand at a, a standing desk you can go sit at a at a normal seated desk and do all those different types of things but you can mix it up and in particular for the child i think it's important that they learn again to listen to their body and to kind of know when they need to wiggle and move but by the way, here's the task. Here's what we need you to complete. If you, if you need to do that while dancing, that, that's fine. And it's hard for teachers because they want, they want to maintain classroom management. But for the teachers who have stepped out in this direction, what they're finding is that they're able to maintain better classroom management when they have an environment where some of the children who have to move can move. If they try to not allow them to move, in other words, sit down, sit still, be quiet, about a third of the kids, they just can't do it. And so now you're creating a situation for failure, right? You, you've set, you set yourself up as a teacher for failure and you're going to have discipline problems because that group of kids that can't sit still and be quiet, they're going to act out. And, you know, that, that's not good. So in essence, the, the South Park school bus driver yelling, sit down and shut up. You're telling us that that's really 1950s type leadership that isn't what we really want to have with our kids. Yeah, I think that's very dated. You're right. I think we've got to we got to rethink the way that we do that. If you look at what's gone on in so many schools where this is has become standard is to allow kids to move more. Uh, they're having much greater success and much less discipline problems. So you know, I think the evidence is is mounting. Uh, that this is the case. And I believe we're starting to design offices like this. You know, we're starting to design offices with much more creative movement encouraged and allowed and many more spaces to do what we call work. Uh, you know, we used to be so tethered and kind of tied uh, to our desk. That was it, right? But I think now with the mobile devices and so much more happening with mobile devices, you know, we're able to be up and about and move around and change positions. And it's really good for us. It's really great for our relationships too, to get out away from being behind the screen and go out and interact. And again, look people in the eye and, and, you know, pick up on those facial expressions and the, the tone of their voice and their body language. And um, it's very difficult to do that, you know, through an email or, or even a, even a voicemail at you know, two o'clock in the morning, if you're crazy enough to pick them up at that hour. You know, you talk about mobile devices and you've done some studies on uh, workers at home versus workers in the office. You know, I've used some mobile devices and I'll be honest with you so far, Dr. Benden, 
the tiny little mobile keyboards, they don't work for me, the ones that I've tried. I'd rather be at my office with a nice ergonomic keyboard than on the road with a tiny little keyboard that doesn't have nice wrist rests and things like that. Are mobile devices getting to the point where there are ergonomic options out there? I think they're getting better. Um, I believe that what's happened to really help with this trend, because you are correct that in general, you know, miniaturized keyboards or even worse, a a touchscreen keyboard on a small mobile device, Mm -hmm. they are nowhere near the ergonomics that you would get from a a nice ergonomic keyboard and a a proper mouse at a good workstation that's adjustable. So no, no question that that's the case. While that trend was happening and most of us that were ergonomists at the time were, were in a little bit of a panic because we sort of saw the, uh, let's just say the biomechanics of all of that evolving, the software at the same time was becoming so much more efficient that what we worried about, let's, let's go back, say 10 years ago, what we worried you'd be doing on your little miniature mobile devices for hours and hours and hours was our fear. Uh, biomechanically, that would have been a train wreck. What we worried about never came to pass. And that's good because what, what happened was the devices not only got smaller and physically harder to key on or type on, but you were able to enter much less in the way of keystrokes to get the same work done. So you became, because of the software and the interfaces, the programs, you became much more efficient using the devices than what we sort of foresaw, you know, so we foresaw the biomechanics and I still believe that was correct. And that is an issue. You're seeing that with things like a texting thumb for a lot of the younger people now, because they spend so much time with, you know, both thumbs texting. So the biomechanics certainly was there and is still there and is still a concern. But fortunately we really avoided the, the big disaster, right? The, the worst case scenario of sort of everybody's hands so cramped up, they can't use them. We, we avoided that through efficiency and software. And so that's been a positive. Now we're probably reaching sort of another kind of tipping point. And this worries me with home workers because probably for, for a lot of us professionals, we know we don't have a true work day. Uh, the limits, particularly in the United States, were interesting uh, how we work 24 seven. Again, at 2 a.m., if we receive the the email or the voicemail from the boss, you know, we're, we're on it. Got to respond to it. It's not common around the world, that, that level of, of focus and dedication and work ethic. But again, I, I'm not sure in the long run that that's healthy for us. I'm not sure that that's going to prove to be something that uh, we really should be doing. And so we're taking a look at that. We're taking a look at the impact of that on our relationships, you know, trying to understand how that affects uh, kind of the work and, and, and family life balance, but also our health. If we are doing those things from a biomechanic standpoint, you know, 24 seven, there's a greater likelihood that it would cause harm that we'd have some sort of a injury or illness from it. But then, you know, also there's a toll, right? There's a toll on our stress levels and constantly being sort of up at that amped up state. We'll see, we'll see where it all plays out and how it shakes out. But again, it is a moving target just about the time we think we really know what's going to happen or how the the human in the loop is going to respond. They, they surprise us and they get creative and inventive and things change. So, uh, it's, it's a constant, uh, game of trying to figure some of these things out before they get bad while those very same things are changing or morphing. So even with ergonomics and industrial engineering, nothing is ever set in stone. Just like, you know, all of humanity, we're always looking to build a better mousetrap. And when that better mousetrap comes, we're always looking iteratively to how society changes around that mousetrap to build another better mousetrap. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's fascinating. Uh, One of my early experiences in ergonomics on the production floor, we had a product that was very heavy and very difficult for the workers to handle. And there had been quite a few uh, cumulative trauma type disorders that had developed amongst the workers. And so the ergonomics of it said, this is too heavy and too hard to handle. And so the fix was that we eliminated a lot of the material to create essentially uh, finger holds, uh, thumb holds to be able to, to grip it better. Mm-hmm. Well, in the process of doing that, of course, we cut a lot of weight out. So it was lighter. It was easier to grip and hold. But lo and behold, it was much cheaper for the company to produce. And they had fewer quality problems because the material stayed consistent throughout that it, since it wasn't just kind of a big, uh, a big blob. So the lesson there, I think, is the same with these office situations in that you know, we, we go at it a lot of times with sort of one thing in mind. A lot of times we get multiple benefits. We get improvements in productivity, 
uh, even though we might be chasing health or we get improvements in health, even though we may be chasing productivity. That's a classic win, win, win of our industrial engineering plus ergonomics, isn't it? It really is. And, you know, I, I, I'd love to say that every single time I've worked on a project like that, either in the plant floor or, you know, in the office, that's how it turned out. But that's, that's not the case. Uh, sometimes you, you get one and not the other. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you get neither and you go back to the drawing board and, right. you know, you, start start at it again. Well, I have run out of all of the questions that I had for this, but if there is something, Dr. Benden, that I neglected to ask that you would like to bring up about any of the subjects we've touched on or preview what you plan on doing at Applied Ergonomics 2020, if you plan on visiting us in Louisville, this is kind of your open-ended question. Sure. I would say probably the, the biggest thing for folks that are going to be attending uh, in Louisville this, this spring would be to look for a couple of our studies on the home worker. So this is the person who is based, they're an office worker, they're based out of their home. And we're taking a really hard look at things like their indoor air quality, their sedentary behavior compared to you know someone who goes into an office complex and moves around that office complex throughout the day. And then their, their objective output, you know, how long do they spend on the computer? How many words do they get typed in a day? And errors, you know, do they make during the day and, you know, when do they get most of their work done? And so we're, we're taking a really hard look at that and we'll have all of that data prepared for everyone there at the Applied Ergonomics Conference. This has been another episode of Problem Solve with ISC's Michael Hughes interviewing Dr. Mark Benden, Director, Texas A&M Ergonomics Center. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. This has been an episode of Problem Solved, the IISE podcast. If you like what you've heard, then please share this podcast with your friends and colleagues. If you're an IISE member, you can participate in discussions about this and other episodes at connect.iise.org. If you're not a member yet, then you can learn all about the Institute of Industrial and Systems Engineers at our website, iise.org. Thanks for listening to our show. 